Thank you, Dr. Alok, and uh, thank you to our great colleagues in Beirut, and uh, cordial welcome to our colleagues in France. Uh, it's a great honor to be allowed to speak here, and it's uh, spoken with the greatest of appreciation for your medical culture and accomplishments. And it's customary to start these lectures with a conflict of interest disclaimer, and let me just tell you, I'm heavily conflicted about Professor Dubusset. I love the man, he is my hero, and whatever I know, I owe to him. So I'm completely conflicted. Um, I hopefully will stay within 15 minutes and just basically talk about a bigger picture than angles and lines relative to the spine. And let me tell you, I'm a proud spine surgeon. I know that we can positively change lives. It's a huge burden of disease to walk around like this person in the 14th century that I saw in a, uh, in a, uh, a display in Holland. Uh, you can't even think about how this person lived, but it's amazing to see that this person probably got uh, into her 50s. And yes, this is just a routine picture of an uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. These are amazing breakthroughs that have been done. And again, Professor Dubusset and our French colleagues had such an amazing impact in terms of teaching us the techniques and a better understanding. And yes, this is just a quick example of how we can change lives. And yes, we've done them open traditionally, and I'm still an open surgeon, but by cutting the spinal column, we can straighten out the spine and hopefully keep it there. Now that right-hand top box shows a couple of things that are adversely affected uh, by a deformed kyphotic spine, pulmonary, cardiac, digestive, neurologic pain, and depression. So it's a whole cascade that starts somewhere in the trunk and finally ends up in the brain and then goes back down the body again. And I am not going to talk about angles and lines here. All of you have plenty of resources, and I'm greatly honored to again have a partner, Dr. Bob Hart, who's one of the senior members of the ISSG. And yes, Bob, senior is a euphemism for getting old. So you and I are both old geezers now. But there's a great resource material. I personally will conjecturize to you that we may have a little bit of a hyper focus on angles and lines and have gone into too schematic of a thought process of how to straighten out a spine uh, in a geometric fashion. And I'm always worried when I encounter dogma. Yes, this comes as a surprise as somebody from Germany, but I'm a little bit worried about dogma. I want uh, to have a bigger picture. One thing I want to also write out, uh, throw out there is I hear more and more talk about not correcting too much in this age group or that. I am really worried about that. We've been there. We've done that. That doesn't work for me. Intelligent rebalancing of the spine, if we then do surgery, is a big deal. And this is, again, my hero, uh, Professor Dubusset, who I got to experience when I was a resident in Texas. And again, the cone of economy goes beyond the cone of economy as a ergonomic statement. It's a psychological statement. It's a, a natural statement in terms of physiology and harmony of nature. Recreating a harmony of the spine as a carrier for our head is, I think, the goal. And again, there's so much more that goes into the body habitus. I saw this little diagram on the internet, so I saw I put that up, but I'm not gonna read through this, but there are multiple different variants that come into play as we look at spinal alignment that are not done justice by the current angle and line fixation. And again, this doesn't even start to address the body habitus, which in our country veers towards the right side or the muscular self-dedication of patients. So these variables are a big deal. And again, in our spine fixation, we do need to start from the base. That's my one thing to my neurosurgical colleagues, start with the feet, the ankles, the knees, and the hips, and go up from there. Again, dogma is a problem. And again, uh, whenever we kind of just have a simple uh, ascription to something, uh, that's a problem. And as we face deformity patients and increasing numbers are asked to deal with harder and more difficult and uh, sick patients, we really need to think about how do we do, uh, how do we approach them? Do we do nothing? Uh, is there some intelligent non-surgical way that does not turn them into opiate addicts? Or should we have a rigid spinal column as the ultimate ratio? And again, when we do spine surgery, there are certain areas that are really well regarded. Uh, there are others which are heavily scrutinized. And the expensive big time procedures are very much under scrutiny, not just in our country, in terms of the so-called value proposition. So what's the benefit versus the cost? And this is something that, again, the ISSG and now increasing the AO has done a great job with trying to understand and quantify better, but we don't have that yet. But a major spine surgery in the U.S. is somewhere between 40 to 200,000 U.S. dollars. 
And again, uh, there's a significant outlier when we have major complications, which easily are $50,000, but can be much, much higher. That's from Joseph Cheng's famous article from 2014. And this is where I want to make my first point. Do we really understand what complications are? I'm not going to ask you to read two slides, but just on the top right, this is done from the SRS in a summary statement. Complications in major deformity surgery were estimated to be roughly about 30 to 50 percent. There are other papers that basically came in with lower numbers, 20 something percent. That was a large uh, number of people who said that. And when we did a, a, a longer term assessment, uh, first of all, at WashU, they basically identified 12 to 20% again. When we looked at it at UW, we came up with 40%. And this was a pretty well done study methodologically, where we had problems like you see a, dis a disengaged rod. Uh, we identified over 40% of complications, uh, significant complications. And of course, you can say we're inept surgeons. But uh, these are, again, things that then were restudied. And this is the first study I want to really present here in greater depth by our Vancouver colleagues. They're literally brothers of ours. We exchange a lot of information with them. They're just north of the border here. And they did a very major, well-performed study to actually capture complications and major spine surgeries. This is an award-winning paper. And again, these are the, the kind of general major papers that identified larger uh, spine surgery complication rates. And the Vancouver friends, and this is usually something I do as a question, but this is not possible in this format, they basically identified the complications. And if I asked Elias, our wonderful Beirut representative here, which category did the Vancouver colleagues in this well-controlled city identify, what number would you give me? He said three, so 26 to 50 percent. Drum roll, the actual complication rate was 87 percent. These are excellent surgeons. This is a very well-run center. These are not schlocks. These are very good doctors. So how can this be? Basically, this is the first time that somebody actually prospectively tracked all patients and had well-defined criteria. So it's actually better than our Washington study. So basically, um, the main problem is that complications have been underreported through a variety of methodological problems. Major surgeries can have major complications, and we need to differentiate them intelligently and honestly in terms of preventable and just matter-of-fact ones. And uh, that's the main thing. So education, host optimization are the two opportunities where we can make a big difference. And managing risk is a very big thing we call the transactional approach. We basically try to have a very fair and balanced uh, kind of a discussion as to what are the pros and what are the cons. And all too often, I find ourselves as kind of being like salesmen who try to uh, sell you a, a, a bad car. I'm not going to mention any manufacturers as a German here, but uh, basically this is, uh, this is just a common problem that we oversell. We're supposed to be a, a, a source of wisdom and thought as we interact with our patients. And this is where I want to make point number two. The focus should always be the patient. Who is this actually beyond the angles that we see? What's going on in their mind, in their heart, in their psychosocial setting? And this is what Elias challenged me to talk about. This is a German word, but it's become very commonly used in the U.S. language. It's called the gestalt, the bigger picture appearance of a patient. So beyond angles and lines, understanding the gestalt of a patient. Because there's so much that goes into a patient who stands forward something like this. And let's start with the head. Depression, uh, severe kind of a maladjustment to the environment, lack of nutrition, lack of activities, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. Understanding this big picture as a framework of the patient mandates that we don't just measure angles with our wonderful ER system, thanks to Professor Dubuisset, uh, but we have to literally act like psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and do a very good exam on patients. So understanding our patients, getting to know them beyond just making a snap judgment for surgery is a really big deal. So examining them personally, physically examining, again, starting with their legs, and uh, assessing flexible or fixed curves. I, for instance, find the recumbent test way underutilized. Can a patient, when they're laying flat, still breathe easily? Does their spine roll out straight or does it stay crooked? Those are big differences. How are their knees? How are their hips? This leads me to point three, prehab. So our former partner, Dr. David Hanscom, was one of the pioneers in the U.S. over 20 years ago to make sure that patients uh, uh, get really identified in their own identities, that we have research-based advancements, education uh, of applications, health status-related activities as goal, and better outcomes. So five simple things that we're nowadays really trying to do, and we're not always good at it, but if we do error analyses, 
it's usually a deviation of one or more of these factors. Detoxify our patients from opiates and uh, sedatives, weight and nutritional optimization, protein up, weight down, glycemic control. Nicotine cessation is a big deal. We're about to come out with a very major study through one of our wonderful fellows. And uh, it is actually worse than what we thought. And this is a very large global study that we did. Psychosocial wellness and cardiopulmonary fitness. The recumbent bike as an example. So we have to look for details in a far more comprehensive fashion than ever before. Bone quality, understanding connective tissues, understanding neuropathies and posterior column diseases and neuromuscular diseases way better than we've done before. And identifying the adverse effects of some medications like steroids, anti-TNF medications and non-steroidals. Prehab, again, understanding bone posture and balance and educating our patients beforehand so that we don't give them a rigid uh, device into their back that they then just fall like an interior internal hanging from is a really big deal. So this re-education is a physiatry, a rehab thing that we as spine surgeons should control and not just delegates to PTs, that means physiotherapists or rehab doctors. Fourth point is risk management. So identified that risks are far more common than done. This is an older <clears throat> 2012 technology that we developed at UW, at the University of Washington, my time there. And this is still publicly available. There's no tracking. tracking. It's called SpineSage. I still like this because it was actually done on over 4,000 patients. And the variables are 21. You can access it simply online, at University of Washington SpineSage. We have an invasiveness level that's kind of uh, scientifically proven. And again, we've mount, uh, in, the, in that era did an open surgeries. Basically, we did not have MISS or X-lift type far lateral techniques available then. But uh, with that caveat in mind, we can identify with a pretty high accuracy what the overall complication range is and infection risk and uh, general outcomes. So this is something that I have used commonly to kind of quantify visually to my patients what it means to do these bigger surgeries. And it helps. And interestingly, most patients accept the risks. Maybe that's because we as human beings have a very poor risk-taking quantification. But raising awareness helps us all because quality organizations, insurance companies, hospitals, hopefully will have a better respect and understanding for what we're doing. Now, my fourth point is going to be the following. It's very hard for us to look into the minds of patients. If I just run through these two patients, patient A, pretty big, old, never treated idiopathic scoliosis, pain all over. This is almost the same scoliosis, maybe even a little bit worse, neurologically intact, 61-year-old female, pain all over, neurologic exam like and the predecessor, uh, uh, pretty much normal. Which patient would need surgery? I'll ask Elias again and then tell everybody, which patient, A or B, will need surgery? wants to have surgery, assuming only one ha has surgery. He says B will need surgery. Bob, A or B? I'm looking at the, uh, at the sagittal one. I think uh, A is out of sagittal alignment, and therefore that's the one that's going to need. So A, doc, we have a disagreement. It's fantastic as a sample. Two surgeons, one says A, the other one will say B. Patient A got a long fusion. Uh, I did not do a perfect job with sagittal reconstruction. She is an extremely happy long-term patient. She's now 68, actually, I have to say. She's become a donor. She is, uh, has given a large, large, generous donation to us uh, and continues to be a sponsor for us. She is very happy with the surgery. And these are her outcome studies, her patient-reported outcomes, and they showed a very favorable response. Now let's look at the other patients. This is actually a, a pixelated study after, I think I know her now for six years or so. She remains very reasonably happy. If I look at her scores, they're literally no different from the surgically treated patient. Something is going on in her mind that lets her continue to be relatively happy with her study. Maybe she's from Iowa, like the place where Dr. Hart trained. She's actually a French-American lady, so maybe it's red wine or the French uh, 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 vivre, the, the joy of life. We don't know. But basically, doing these surgeries is a big deal. Things that if we do surgery, post-operatively drive me nuts. I just want to expand on that, are having done a major surgery and seeing patients propped up in their beds, putting a fulcrum on the upper instrumentation, pulling patients up from their arms, having patients walk with a walker forward bent like a shopping cart, and having a generally poor posture. So those are things that we have to avoid. And again, this is just one of my failures. We did a multi-level osteotomy on this patient. She was thrilled for about four years. 
and we did a nice junctional preservation surgery. And lo and behold, she fell apart. She had some Parkinson's. We expanded her. And this brings me again to mobilization. We need to be better physiatrists. We need to have really better lookouts in terms of how to mobilize patients with sticks, for instance, prone position exercises, et cetera. This is a patient that I revised, and she was actually very happy after her T3 uh, to pelvis fusion. So these are possible. So major surgery is a major undertaking. We need to really uh, report our complications more honestly and have a more shared decision-making. That means partnership with the patients and their families. Uh, we need to basically probably do a better job at prehabbing and being the uh, rehab doctors that are enlightened. And we need to track our progress through registries. That's the main thing. The burden of disease uh, of spine is fundamental, but getting to the gestalt of patients is, I think, the key towards better results. Thank you so much.